Hi everybody, welcome to Elementary Classical Mechanics, the subject where observing the universe suggests new mathematical and computational approaches that can literally transform our way of modeling and predicting any aspect of the world. Welcome back to the fourth and final lecture of Chapter 5. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about the problems at the end of the chapter. Okay, problem one is a problem about Newton's first law, that momentum does not change in a particular direction unless there's a force acting in that direction. So in this problem, you throw a ball up in the air. All right, so you give it an initial velocity. Think of the coordinate systems I, J, K. The only force acting on the particle is the force in, is gravity in the minus k direction. There's no force in the i direction. There's no force in the j direction. So if you give it an initial velocity in, it has a component in i, j, and k. You can see the value of the vector description of things. The i and j component of velocity will not change. They will be exactly the same as they are for the initial velocity. There's no force in those directions. Anyway, that's the idea, and so you need to flesh out the problem a little bit and think about that. Newton's first law is a very powerful idea. Okay, the second problem, particle of mass m moves along a straight line. That's what you're told. Which, and it has a force, a constant force acting on it. So we can take that, we know that if it moves along a straight line, the force has to be acting in that line. It can't be acting sideways or up or down. It's acting along the line. So we're free to choose whatever line we want as our coordinate system. Let's just choose the uh, I direction, X coordinate. All right, so we can easily set up uh, Newton's second law. And we can compute using the techniques of this chapter, the speed magnitude of velocity, the velocity as a function of time, distance traveled after time t, and something a little bit different, the speed as a function of position. So we need to use um, the previous results to eliminate time and just get speed as a function of position. Okay, and problem three is very similar. In fact, it's, it seems like it's a separate, separate problem. Well, it is a separate problem, but you throw a ball straight up in the air. So in the k direction, the only force acting on it is the gravitational force minus mg k. So it's acting straight down in the k direction, vertical direction. So I want you to do exactly the same four things. Well, not exactly. Sorry about that. Position at any time. The time taken to reach the highest point What's the highest point? Well, it's going to go up and up and up, and then it's going to stop when it can't go any higher, and that will be where, where its velocity is zero. And you'll be able to compute the time from the formula that we have. Maximum height reach, well, you have the right time, and you plug in the position, vertical position, as a function of the time it takes to reach the highest point. And then speed is a function of distance from the origin. Now that is exactly the same as part D from problem two. Problem four is a harder problem. It's exactly the same as um, problem three, except I'm including a resistance force. This force acts in the opposite direction of motion as the particle is falling. Beta is a parameter, um, and it's positive. And uh, V is a velocity. So we need to set up the equations of motion, and you need to find how to integrate them or solve them. And it's one of the um, techniques that I talked about in the chapter. 
So what you're asked is, is speed is a function of time, distance travel is a function of time. Okay, acceleration at any positive time, well, you're going to get that from just writing the equations down. So the A and B will be from integrating the equations. Now, the part after C is interesting. A limiting speed, as it falls and falls and falls and falls, it can't get faster and faster and faster. I mean, no matter how high it is, it's going to, there, there would be a limiting speed, a terminal velocity. And you'll be able to see that from the equations of motion that you're going to have a limiting velocity. As time goes to infinity, the velocity will approach a constant, provided it has enough space to fall. Okay, problem five is a problem about properties of ordinary differential equations. This is a linear ODE, and the focus is on these last terms, C0 plus C1 of T. Those are the terms that do not multiply um, S or S dot. Okay. If those two terms are zero, we, call, we refer to these ODE as homogeneous. And this, is, this problem is about the superposition principle. If you have a homogeneous linear ODE, if you have two solutions, then the sum of those two solutions is also a solution. There's a lot of interesting mathematics behind this. What if you have three solutions and so on? I'm just asking you about this right now. Superposition is one of the hallmarks of linear systems. And it has, it, it is extremely powerful, and you're going to see it in many different courses that you take. But then I ask you to superposition hold for non-homogeneous ODEs. If I have C0 and C1 of T, they're non-zero. Well, have a look at that. And then I ask you part uh, D is actually using superposition to get some get information about the solution. Okay, problem six, I ask you whether or not the equations are linear or nonlinear. It's very important to be able to look at a system and recognize the form it, it has. You don't know quite yet why nonlinear and linear, th that distinction is extremely important, but it is going to be something you need to recognize instantly once you have written down Newton's equations for a system, because it's going to suggest um, uh, techniques and methods for solution or understanding the nature of solutions. Problem 7 and 8 are pretty easy. They're just integrating Newton's equation. 7 is, you know, you've done this before already. I've just put this in here. Okay, problem 9, that looks like a nonlinear second order ODE. And what I want you to show explicitly, oh, let me go back to that. I think I went a little too fast. Okay. I want you to solve for S. I want you to solve the equations. And if you go, this is one of the, um, this is one of the cases where the force is only a function of the position. And that's where we had this function. I said it looks a lot like energy, and we're going to meet it later on. Um, so that's that's uh, the big hint for problem nine. Problem ten, you can, you see here Newton's second law. You have a mass, and what I'm showing you here, and this is something that you do often in applications. The mass is just a constant that you know you drag around, but if you rescale time, define a new time tau which is the square root of m, t is the square root of m times tau, you can, in the new time, you can eliminate the mass from the equation. It's called rescaling, an example of rescaling. It's part of a, a bigger theory for, that comes that is used quite a bit. So this may be your first time seeing that, but uh, we're going to see it later on when we look at the simple pendulum. So this is a this is a good exercise to understand. I mean, uh, it uses a chain rule, and and uh, uh, it's it's 
it's deceptively simple, but you need to understand every aspect of it. And finally, we have a nonlinear system. I want you to show that uh, superposition principle, as discussed in the earlier problem, does not hold for nonlinear systems. And that's a big deal. That's a big difference between linear and nonlinear systems. So these are the problems. Do all of them. You have the solutions in the uh, solutions manual. And in the next chapter, we're going to talk about projectiles, constrained motion, and friction. And there are three problems in this chapter. And they're both, all three illustrate something very interesting. So bye for now.